My father that day decided what to do was, if I failed and I'm worthless to my family, I must leave. And he did. And to me, it was the worst day of my life. I'll never forget it. I loved him more than anything. I had four fathers. He's the one I finally got attached to. It's like, mom, I'm confused. But then finally, years later, I got the benefit of it because out of all those experiences and all that pain, that day I made three different decisions. First decision is I just decided to focus on something different than him. And that's the power we have. We get to decide what to focus on. And my decision number one is, I want to focus on the fact there's food. What a concept. Pretty cool. But the most powerful thing to change my life was meaning. I said, what does this mean? Because my father had always said, my mother had always said, nobody gives a shit. Nobody cares. Don't care about anybody, they don't care about you. And that day I had physical evidence. Those you bringing food, I want you to know that's not just food. That's called love for someone. That's called hope for someone. That's called surprise for someone. And that day for me, I went, strangers care. And so I started caring about strangers. And I decided someday I'm gonna do the same. So when I was 17, I fed two families. It was like one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I went to the grocery store, I was all excited, saved up all my money. Went to the manager and said, I want to feed two families. This is what I'm doing. It's not for me. Give me a discount. And he gave me 10%. I thought, cheap bastard. But I went out and I delivered this food. And ironically, um, I called this church. And I asked in the barrio, a particular place, where are some families in need? They gave me two names. I put on t-shirt, jeans. I wasn't going to be acknowledged. I also didn't want somebody to be insulted because I saw what happened to my father. And I wrote a note, said, this is a note from a friend. And I said, I just want you to know, we know you're having difficult times. Everyone does at times. And I want you to have a beautiful Thanksgiving. And please feel loved, take care of your family. And someday, if you can, do well enough to do this for one other family and pass it on. But love a friend. And I had it written in Spanish as well. And I'll never forget, first place I pull up, this rotten old van, stick shift van, that I borrowed from a buddy of mine all these bags of food and I went into this place and got out pulled up this little tiny building really tiny knocked on the door and when I knocked on the door this little woman opened the door it's probably half my size she's not hard I'm six seven so she's like five two and she looked up at me like this and she saw the groceries and she screamed and she started grab my head and pull it down to kiss me and I was like no 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 delivery boy delivery boy and she goes, no, God gift, God gift, God gift. And she didn't speak English, so I handed her the note. She read the note, she crying again, started trying to kiss me again. I said, no, no. And she goes, God gift, God gift. So I pointed, where do I put this? In this tiny little room. There's a table there. I put the food down. And I went over to get some more groceries. And when I did, four children come running out. And one hits my leg and wouldn't let go. And when they saw the pumpkin pie, it was over. <laughs> and... It was one of the most emotional experiences of my life because first of all, this little boy just wouldn't let go. And I delivered this food and this woman was crying and smiling. And I stayed there just to take it in for a few minutes, seeing them all. It was like going back in time. And then as I went to go leave, I couldn't speak Spanish. And she was like trying to say something in Spanish. And I didn't know what to say. And it was Thanksgiving. So I said, Elise Navidad. <laughs> She's like, I heard the song, okay? <laughs> and she laughed and laughed. She's crying and laughing. One of the more beautiful experiences of life, isn't it? When you have both those experiences in your body simultaneously. And I remember I got in the van and all the three, four kids were sitting on the, on the bench here. And she's standing there waving and I pulled in going reverse. And I looked in the mirror and as I looked in the mirror, I saw these kids there and I saw mom crying and smiling still. And then I lost it. I started crying uncontrollably. And I'm like put, trying to put the thing in gear the tears come through my eyes and I thought to myself, what? I mean, this is a beautiful thing. Why am I crying? And then I realized what a gift that day was. I realized that my worst day of my life was my best day. And my goal for you, if you don't already have it, my guess is you've already done it, knowing where you are in your world today. But maybe your second worst day, it's time to make a best day. Because out of every tragedy, out of every pain, it only gets healed when we find a deeper meaning. When we find there's a higher purpose in it. 
And I realized that I wouldn't have been there that day. I wouldn't have that hunger to help somebody else if I hadn't had the hunger in my own soul at one point missing. So it's very personal to me. I want to thank all of you that made the contributions. And I told Mark and I've announced that I'm going to match the million meals if you hit it. And I'm sure as hell expecting that you will. And so we'll get two million. And when I told that, then Mark said, I'll match that. <laughs> So in the mid-1980s, a theologian named James Carsey wrote this little book called Finite and Infinite Games, in which he defines these two kinds of games. Uh, finite games, which have known players, fixed rules, and agreed upon objectives. Football, right? There's always a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and the, object the objective is to win the game. Um, and then there's infinite games. Infinite games are defined as known and unknown players. You don't necessarily know who all the other players are. Um, the rules are changeable. You can play however you want. Um, and the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. Um, what I find so fascinating about this idea when I first learned about it is we are players in multiple infinite games every day of our lives. There's just no such thing as being the winner in your marriage, you know. Um, um, there's no such thing as winning global politics, and there's definitely no such thing as winning business. Um, business is an infinite game. Um, and yet, when we listen to the language of too many leaders, they talk about being number one, being the best, and beating their competition. Based on what? There's no agreed upon objectives, there's no agreed upon time frames. And so what ends up happening is you have people building organizations and leading with a finite mindset, playing to win in a game where there's no such thing as winning. And when we play with a finite mindset in an infinite game, there's a few very predictable and consistent outcomes, amongst which include the decline of trust, the decline of cooperation, uh, the decline of innovation, all of which contribute to the eventual demise of the organization itself. Um, and so what I wrote about is, is, is what it means to lead with an infinite mindset. Because we teach leadership as if it were a finite game. Um, and, you know, people start business with the goal of winning, being number one, and, and that's a problem um, because that's impossible. Um, so what I wrote about in a game is, is leading with an infinite mindset. I want to start, so the book is great, by the way, and I really enjoyed it. It's a wonderful pick and mix, as they call it in the UK, of different topics where you're diving in, sometimes very quickly, and then other times a much more prolonged. Yeah, depending but, on the on the subject, and mm. or, <laughs> or depending on how much I knew about, <laughs> the, <laughs> about the subject brought to me that I could then comment on. Equally yeah. fair. Yeah. One of the ones that really hit me was you talking about your dad. You called it a eulogy of sorts. And oh. you went through some of the things that he did, which I actually, I didn't know anything about your dad before reading that. Mm -hmm. What was it about your dad that impacted you so much that you still carry today? So it's not so much, oh, he's my dad. I love my dad. That's all true. But at the end of the day, what matters is for who and what you become in life. For me, at least, was... Uh, what level of wisdom did he glean in his life and then successfully communicate to me, either by example or by just explicit statement? And that combination of those two means of delivery had some important uh, impacts. Impact. See what I did there? <laughs> impacts on my life. Uh, just for example, and I give these examples in that that, that eulogy was a letter to him during the memorial service. He died a couple of years ago at age 89, so it was not, not a tragic death. But you still miss someone even though you know they're ready to check out. And uh, I'll just give one example, if I may. In high school, he was in gym class and they were lining up and they were about to enter the next athletic unit and it was track and field. And the gym instructor pointed to my father online and said, Cyril Tyson, everyone look at him. He does not have the body type that would excel in track. And they used him as an example. And he says, what? No one is going to tell me what I can't do in my life. And he used that as the reason to start running. 
and he started track in that moment. I mean, not that exact moment, but <laughs> he decided that his one of his next tasks in life would be to take up running and excel at it. Within a few years of that, he became world class. At one time, had the fifth fastest time in the world. In the middle distance, they don't run this anymore, 600 yard run. And uh, he, in 1948, the Olympics was not yet ready to come back to us because we're still reeling, roiling from the Second World War. Instead, there was still an Olympics. It was called the GI Olympics, and it was held in Hitler's stadium. Whoa. So he competed in Hitler's stadium uh, in the late 1940s, and just one of the great memories of his life. But the reason I'm saying all of that is, there's a friend of his named Johnny Johnson, who they were competing against the New York Athletic Club. In the day, it mattered that you had amateur status. No one's thinking of that anymore. But back then, you couldn't compete in the Olympics if you were professional at all. And there's a whole... So professional was deemed sort of you were tainted in some way. And it's hard to think that that used to be how people thought. But that's how it was. Uh, in the day, once you graduated college, you needed some sanctioning body to compete with. So there were athletic clubs. The New York Athletic Club at the time accepted only white Protestants. So there was another club called the Pioneer Club, which took everybody who was not accepted to the New York Athletic Club, which was basically blacks and Jews, is really what that came down to, and some Catholics, but basically blacks and Jews. So he competed alongside Jewish athletes. So there they are competing against the New York Athletic Club and his best friend, Johnny Johnson, okay? Was coming around the back stretch, might have been the quarter mile, coming on the final straightaway. And a runner from the New York Athletic Club is a few paces behind him. And Johnny Johnson overhears that runner's coach say, catch that nigger. And he overheard this. So what did he say to himself? He said, this is one nigga he ain't going to catch. <laughs> and that extended his, his, his lead to the finish line. And he tells the story not with any bitter tone, as you might think. Any story like that today would certainly be um, told with, with great remorse and consternation. So he never had that kind of tone when he shared those stories with us. It was, here's an occasion to parlay what today might be called a microaggression into a reason to excel even more than you had expected of your own abilities and talents. And so I have taken that lesson with me. He was just telling a story. He didn't say, let me give my kids a lesson today. No, these are just things that happened in his life. And uh, in my sort of letter to him in death, I recount for the audience several of these examples and that among them. If some of y'all, you got some homeboys you connected with, but you know they ain't really living how you supposed to be living and they leading you down the wrong way, you know from Brian's story, yo, if I remove myself from it, if I plug in with positive people, I can make it. Why would you waste one second doing something that wasn't progressing your dream? Go after this thing called life. And don't look back and have regrets. Understand that you're in a place and a position right now when hard work and valuing people, nothing. I promise you. I promise you that everything is not going to go the way you wanted it to on every single play. It's not supposed to. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be difficult. Anything that comes fast and easy leaves you the same way. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with time this tough? What are you willing to sacrifice for greatness? 
Your future self is counting on your current self to never take shortcuts and never lack integrity. Because a day will come for you to walk with character and have clarity. Greatness is your destiny. But at times you must reboot your mental computer. Because every step you take today will directly affect your future. And so when I live from the moment, what I'm doing is I'm celebrating it, I'm acknowledging it, and I'm able to be present in it. And so what stops me from, from that is the guilt of the past and the anxiety of the past and the resistance of, of what you know I've been through, afraid of going through it again. Some become a victim to life. Things happen, pain heartache and loss, we can either be the victim or the victor to these situations. They say win or lose, at least you took part, but this is life. I am not here to take part. I am here to win one life. You'll never be able to fix what's behind you. You have to run after what's in front of you. We're affected by how we feel. First, we're affected by what we know and the decisions we make. Second, we're affected by attitude, how we feel. And I gave that quick list. Let me give it to you. It's how you feel about the past. You've got to have a good attitude about the past. Use it as a school, not a club. Don't beat yourself to death with your past. Falls, failures, losses. Let the past be a school, harsh school maybe. What else is new? Let the past be a school master to teach you, not to threaten you, but to teach you. Next, it's how you feel about the future. Set your goals. Promise of the future is an awesome force to affect your life every day. Without a future well-designed, we take hesitant steps. And all you have to have is hesitant steps for six years. You'll be timid, driven into a corner, not boldly willing to go and take your portion, take your share. Next, it's how you feel about everybody else. Got to have a good attitude about everybody else because it takes everybody else to make a market. One person doesn't make a family. One person doesn't make a business. One person doesn't make a corporation. One person doesn't make a community. And here's the last one. It's how you feel about yourself. Understanding self-worth is the beginning of progress. Self-worth should be easy. If one of us can do it, all of us can do it. If anybody can think it, we all can think it. I can read, you can read. I can understand, you can understand. From where I came from, the few simple things I did and tried revolutionized my life in five years. There isn't anybody here that can't do it. Change from pennies to fortune. Change from nothing to something. Change from broke to rich. Anybody in this room can do it. If any of us can do it, we all can do it. That's the kind of value you should place on yourself. If Jim Rohn can understand it, I can understand it. If he can read, I can read. If he can find it, I can find it. If he can change, I can change. If you can get it done, I can get it done. That's the attitude about yourself. So valuable. Now, in transforming our lives, we don't start with attitude. We don't start with the inspiration here. We start with education. Somebody says, well, I expected you just come get motivated today. Well, that probably won't do it. Somebody says, by now, we should be standing on the chairs, waving a flag, singing the old gray mare, get going here. No, that's not where you start. Life change does not start with inspiration. Life change starts with education. You've got to be educated to the point of where you might have messed up. My teacher put it in blunt, simple language. He only went to the ninth grade in school, so he put it in simple language I could understand. He said, Mr. Owen, after six years living in America, healthy American male, 25 years old, been working six years, one year of college, pennies in your pocket, nothing in the bank. Schultz said, I just got one simple explanation for that. You've messed up. Now, I could understand that kind of language. Should walk around the block, could walk around the block, won't walk around the block. You have messed up. And all you've got to go is right down through the list. Don't need some teacher to come by and tell you. Be your own best teacher saying, hey, 
Let me make a list of some places I've messed up. Because if I let this down, let this down, that probably affects the rest. And the answer is, that's true. So we don't start with inspiration, we start with education. Somebody says, well, just motivate this guy, he'll be all right. Just motivate him, get him turned on. Probably not. The guy's an idiot, you motivate him, now you got a motivated idiot. No, he won't be all right. So we start with education. What's the first education? If it isn't going well and you live in America, you have messed up. You don't need to change countries. Activity. This is the work part, the labor part, taking action. And the activity is the miracle working piece. A miracle being something we don't quite understand how it works doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means we just don't quite understand how it works. Miracles work. God says. Now, I'm an amateur on God, but here's my best analysis. God says, if you'll plant the seed, I'll make the tree. Now, that's a good arrangement. Number one, gives God the tough end of the deal. What if you had to make the tree? That'd keep you up late night trying to figure out, how do you make a tree? I'd say, no, I'm telling you, the mystery and the miracle of this stuff has already been set up. God says, I got the miracle going, I got the seasons going, I got some sunshine and some rain, and I'm God. But the way I've arranged it, I just need somebody to plant the seed, not chant. California, they're trying to chant to get this stuff done. Forget this California stuff. You don't have to rub a crystal and sleep under a pyramid. This stuff's too easy. Getting rich is too easy. Changing your life is too easy. Forget all that. Massive bombard, affirmation, forget all that, my opinion. Just simple, easy stuff. But if you neglect it, that's how it piles up year after year, if you're willing to straighten it out. And here's one of the keys it's called activity, it's called discipline. Turning wisdom from your philosophy and inspiration, the strengthening of attitude, and faith, and courage, commitment, and all this stuff that comes from attitude. If you're willing to take these two qualities, philosophy and attitude, and invest it into activity, you can have a miracle. Anything short of that, no miracle. Wisdom doesn't perform a miracle. Attitude doesn't perform a miracle. The only thing that performs a miracle of increase called equity is called putting wisdom and attitude into discipline, into labor. And this labor now can perform a miracle. And here's the two parts to the labor. One, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Can't give you better advice than that. Number one, do what you can. You just got to go home and make a list after today. And here's the question to ask as you make this personal list. What am I not doing that would be easy to do? That could greatly change my health, my wealth. What am I not doing I'm neglecting that would be easy to do? Just go home and answer that question personally. You don't have to put the answers on a public bulletin board. This is just all personal stuff. Errors in judgment, disaster. A few simple disciplines, wealth beyond imagination. And if you'll pick up the activity part, the miracle working part, Plant the seed part, take care of your part. The soil will take care of its part, and the seed will take care of its part. The seasons will take care of their part. The miracle will take care of its part. If you'll take care of your part, call putting it into activity, action. Works miracles. One of Jesus' disciples said to Jesus, it's time to pay our taxes and we don't have any money. To this statement by his disciple, Jesus said, best as I can read the record, Jesus said, no problem. Now, why could he say no problem? Well, word has it, word has it, he was a miracle worker. If you handed a problem to a miracle worker, what would he be inclined to say? No problem. You got to hang out with folks like that. I belong to a small group like that. We do business around the world. You hand these guys a problem, they say no problem. What? How many books would they read to solve it?
as it takes. How early would they get up? Early as it takes. How much information would they get? As much as they needed. So it's what? No problem. You've got to hang out with folks like that. Jesus said, this will be no problem, the tax thing. He said to his disciples, it's simple. Go fishing. Wow. Now that was easy for this particular disciple. His name was Peter. And Peter was a fisherman. How clever. How clever. But here's the real problem. If you should fish, and you could fish, and you don't fish, you got no miracle. You could change, you should change, you won't change. That's called accumulated disaster. In six years, you'll be explaining instead of celebrating. Having some ragged list like I had, reasons for not doing well pennies in my pocket. Could, should, don't, disaster. And if you'll just start the process of change, could, should, and will, you can start this whole process. And if you will, then put it into action. The miracle belongs to you. Jesus said to his disciple, it'll be simple. Go fishing, and the first fish you catch, look in his mouth. Peter said, okay. He was used to strange things happening. In this relationship, Peter goes fishing, catches the first fish, looks in his mouth. Guess what's in the fish's mouth? Coins. Peter says, wow, coins. <laughs> Starts counting the value of these coins, and when he adds it up, guess how much it added up to? Exactly enough money to pay his taxes and Jesus' taxes. Now, we call that what? A miracle, only because we don't quite understand how it works. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It simply means we don't quite understand how it works. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do, you haven't done, postpone, and start cleaning that up. You can't start at a better place for personal change. It'll affect your bank account, affect your future, affect your income, affect everything. You can't start. a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing. And don't walk like other people walk. Don't postpone like other people postpone. You don't need massive bombard pre-conscious subconscious. Practice channeling, find a 2,000 year gold guru. I mean, you don't need any of that stuff. Pass on all that. Kids are afraid of that stuff. This stuff's too easy. This stuff's too simple. Call, take action, number one, on neglect, on errors. In discipline, number two, start setting up some discipline. And if you'll do that, you'll perform a miracle. Now, here's the second part of the miracle. Number one is do what you can. Here's number two, do the best you can. If that's not your philosophy, I would ask you to amend it. Let me give you the best of ancient script. Here's what it says. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, do it with all your strength, and do it with all your power. What a good philosophy. That kind of philosophy revolutionize your life if you haven't picked it up lately. How much did they first pay you to give up on your dreams? 27 grand a year. And when were you going to stop and come back and do what makes you happy? Good question. I see guys who work at the same company for their entire lives, guys exactly like you. They clock in, they clock out and they never have a moment of happiness. You have an opportunity here, Bob. This is a rebirth. Now, if not for you, do it for your children. Uh, please prepare for this process to continue the rest of your life. Uh, 
there are nothing but difficulties in achieving your goal. Listen, folks, success is hard. It's, it's really hard. Now, when you're trying, you're going to fail. But quitting, just stopping, that was the number one thing I understood. And then number two, you have to make sure that your dreams, your aspirations and goals are so big that not accomplishing them is not an option. There were times I doubted whether or not I can do what I needed to do. There's a Doug Williams in everybody here. There's greatness in you. And you've got to learn how to tune out the critics outside and the critic inside. And since I'm going to do this, I'm going to harness my will. And I'm not going to let anything stop me. I deserve this. When you are trying to get to the next level and you can see where you're trying to get to, there is a ceiling that you have to break through. But in order to get to the next level is because you can see what you want to become. But the only reason you can see the next level is because this ceiling is made of glass. In order to get to the next level, you must be willing to break through the glass. Anytime you break through glass, you are going to get cut. You are going to bleed. And in order to get to the next level, you are going to have to give up something that you care about. You cannot take everything with you. you everybody come with you, can't go with you. See, all your friends, they can't go to the next level because they'll, they'll get up there with you and the way they behave, they'll mess it up for you. So when you go through the glass ceiling, you have to be willing to get cut. The cut is going to put some bruises and blood. But that's the only way to get to the next level. I understood that. I knew that I could not remain the same and, and, and change. You got to grow. You can't hang out with everybody you've been hanging out with to go to the next level. You can't do everything you used to do. If you do that, you'll never grow. You'll get scared sometimes. Your mind will go blank on you. Some people you will allow to unnerve you. And you wonder, what's wrong with me? I'm not crazy. That's why you've got to learn to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to stand up inside yourself. Working on yourself, watching that inner dialogue, it will determine the quality of your life. I don't believe this. I know this. I've had a challenge of losing weight. I'm walking through the airport. This voice say, why don't you have some M&M peanuts? No. <laughs> well, just one. When you're working on something you want to achieve, you have got to stand up to that voice. You've got to sell yourself every day on your abilities, on what you're doing, on the goal that you want to reach. You've got to sell yourself every day, every day, every day. According to your level of belief, it will manifest itself in what you're doing. Whatever we have right now, whatever we're demonstrating in our lives, is a result of what we believe subconsciously that we deserve. I know from living that if you quit, whatever you're trying to accomplish, if you quit, whatever you were trying to accomplish can never happen. There's not even a remote possibility. If you quit, there is no chance of it popping back up again, coming back later. Quitting is guaranteed failure. I don't know what that dream is that you have. I don't care how far-fetched it might appear to be. I don't care how disappointing it might have been as you've been working toward that dream. But here's what I know. That that dream that you're holding in your mind, that it's possible. Let's say that together, please. It's possible. See, sometimes we can't say, I can do that. But what we can say, that it's possible that I can have my dream as we run toward it, as we work on it day in and day out. No one, ladies and gentlemen, could have convinced me when I started out just over six years ago 
working on my dream and I want you to think about whatever your dream is. Because I was willing to take a chance and most people won't do that. Most of the people that you talk to to try and bring them into the business, these are not risk takers. Most people have done all that they're ever going to do. They raise a family, they earn a living and then they die. But people who are running toward their dreams, life has a special kind of meaning. And here's what I will share with you, that in the process of working on your dreams, you are going to incur, incur a lot of disappointment, a lot of failure, a lot of pain, a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. But in the process of doing that, you will discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. What you will realize is that you have greatness within you. What you'll realize is that you're more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine. What you will realize is that you are greater than your circumstances, that you don't have to go through life being a victim. Negative is normal. It's not successful, but it's normal. It's part of life. You must learn to handle the negative. Don't ignore it, handle it. Now, I know some people teach the other way. And listen to them, and listen to me, and then make up your own mind, right? Don't be a follower, be a student. But I say, you got to handle the negative. You don't have to live in it, you don't have to dwell on it, but you do have to handle it my opinion gratitude erases negativity i'm gonna show you how this works if you wake up in the morning you start having negative thoughts man this ain't my day i woke up on the wrong side of the bed i'm tripping i just don't feel myself every time you feel in the middle of the day if you feel yourself doing that stop just stop for a second and start going over in your mind everything you have to be grateful for not everything you want everything you already have because what you have is substantial you just haven't gone over the list and taken inventory in a long time but the fact that you can walk that's a blessing the fact that you woke up that's another blessing the fact that you can see think reason that's another blessing the fact that you can go somewhere and get yourself something to eat that's another blessing the fact that you can go and turn the key and call some place home that's another blessing the ability to dream is a blessing. The, the, the fact that you have an opportunity to get it right is another blessing. The fact that you're beautiful, that's another blessing. The fact that you have any measure of health, that's another blessing. And I'm just talking to you, I don't even know you. I could give you 50 things you ought to be grateful for right now. I don't even know you. Start coding your mind with gratitude. It'll change everything for you. If I was reading a book by Og Mandino called The University of Success, read one line, gave me a chill. I didn't have to read anything else in the book. He said, many of us never realize our greatness because we become sidetracked by secondary activity. We spread ourselves too thin, don't know how to say no. And we find ourselves doing all kinds of things and never ever have time to do those things that we need to do to work on ourselves. And then there goes a second, there goes another second, there goes another second, and we can't stop and hold time. And before you know it, you wake up one day and you're behind in your dreams and your bills. <laughs> so decide that you're going to take some time to work on you that you deserve that from yourself that your life deserves some prime time because you are creating your own production as michael todd would say you are the star of your show you are the director you're writing the script and you will determine whether your life is a smash office hit or flop you determine that working on yourself talking to yourself that's so very important. Overcoming the negative conversation, that inner dialogue that's going on all the time, all the time, even when you don't want it to be there. You can't stop yourself right now from thinking. You can't do it. It's going on. And so learning how to empower yourself, part of doing that is standing up to yourself. You've got to stand up inside yourself sometimes and say, shut up. You've got to do this. 
I was going to give a presentation and this voice inside of me saying, you can't do this. You don't have everything it takes. I shut up. I am behind on my bills and you're telling me what I can't do. I have got to do it. And there is a war on. The minute you were born, you got involved in the war between good and evil, between darkness and light, between negative and positive, between evil and good, between tyranny and democracy, between weeds and human activity. I mean, the war is on. If democracy sleeps, guess who never sleeps? Tyranny. In the absence of light, guess what's automatic? Darkness. If good does not arouse itself and become active, guess what moves in? Evil. It's a war, a mental war, a physical war, a financial war between enterprise and ease, between accomplishment and failure. It's a war. One of the things I have realized, and many of us have, that if you want something out of life, if you want to change yourself, if you want to acquire something, if there's some goal that you want to reach, that is really not easy as some people will make us feel. That living your dream, changing your behaviors, overcoming negative habits, it's challenging. It's hard. That living alone is just very difficult. And once we begin to come to grips with the fact that living is difficult, life is very challenging. I heard a song once by a guy named Dimples called, If it ain't one thing, it's another. <laughs> I say to you, if it ain't one thing, it's 12 others. Always something. You will never, ever have a problem-free moment in life. Somebody said, and I like this, that you either in a problem or just left one or hit it toward one. <laughs> Anybody found that to be so? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's always something. So how do we begin to nurture that hunger? What are the characteristics or the qualities of people that are hungry? What will it take for me to get some of the things that I want? And being hungry for those things. Number one, you've got to work on yourself. It's very important that you engage in an ongoing process to develop you. Spend more time on yourself than what you've been spending. It's very important. You owe that to yourself. The next thing that's important to know Yes, it's possible that you can choose your future and direct the course of your life as you run toward your dream. It's necessary that you have goals, that you write those goals down, that you plan, that you think constantly of how you can begin to improve what it is that you're doing. If it's your presentations, if it's your recruiting skills, whatever that is, it's also necessary that you look for ways to always find a way to pull it out when everybody else thinks that you are defeated. That you've got to take personal responsibility to know that in order to become successful, you've got to make it your personal business to do it. But the next thing, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you that some of you already know that it's hard. It's not easy. It's hard changing your life. It was hard when just over three years ago in the Penobscot building in Detroit, Michigan, where I was operating my business and I fell on some hard times and I was sleeping in my office. It was hard coming into the lobby and the security said, excuse me, Mr. Brown, can we see you for a moment? And I said, yes. And I walked up to the counter and he gave me an envelope and he said, would you mind reading it here? And I opened the envelope and the envelope was from management that said, this is an office tower. It's not a hotel. Please do not sleep in your office. And I said, excuse me, sir. I said, I just work long hours in creating my business. I'm an entrepreneur. And right now things are bad for me, but they're not going to be this way always. And I just asked for the opportunity to continue to operate like I'm doing. I'm not trying to make this my home. And it was hard coming through the lobby. And sometimes they would laugh. There's a guy talking about becoming successful. And look at him. He's bathing in the bathroom upstairs on the 21st floor. He sleeps on the floor. Him and two other dreamers up there. Look at him. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen, coming to speak to people. 
and I was facing financial difficulties in my own life. I was behind on my bills and my dreams, and I'm saying to them, you can live your dream. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very difficult to pick myself up each day believing that I could do it. There were times that I doubted myself. I said, God, why, why is this happening to me? I'm just trying to take care of my children and my mother. I'm not trying to steal or rob from anybody. Why did this have to happen to me? It was very hard. And here's what I want to say to you. For those of you that have experienced some hardships, don't give up on your dream. No one could have convinced me by holding on, by continuing to push forward, by continuing to run toward my dream, that one day I would have my own talk show. It's a long shot, ladies and gentlemen, from Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor never knowing my mother or father. It's a long shot being here with you today in this dome in Atlanta. It's a long shot. No college training, labeled, educable, mentally retarded. But I kept running toward my dream. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop running toward your dream. It's very important as you hold on to that dream. There are moments when you're going to doubt yourself. There are rough times are going to come, but they have not come to stay. They have come to pass. It's very important for you to know that. Don't say I'm having a bad day. Say I'm having a character building day. It's very important for you to believe that you are the one to make this happen. Myself, can I do this? And something said within me, you're the one. You're the one. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. While you're here, and before you go back home to your respective cities and communities, write down at least five reasons on why you deserve your dream, on why you won't give up, what's going to make you unstoppable, why you must be unreasonable, because logical, practical thinking says you can't do it today. But if you want to produce unreasonable results in your life, like living your dream and taking charge of your destiny, you've got to be an unreasonable person. You've got to be an uncommon person. 